I'm going to talk about urban issues and uh, some thoughts that I've developed along my, my when, when we are experiencing planning in, in Africa, in Angola. And uh, uh, the main idea is that, in fact, uh, cities are quite different from each other, and that difference somehow depends on the context, and the context around the world. Although they are common issues, that's why we are producing science. Uh, they have also uh, specificities that are important to consider when do policy. So that's um, uh, the aim is to present uh, uh, to understand urban divide problems. And uh, just looking at this Casablanca, Rwanda, and Lima, uh, Casablanca is 3.5 million, Lima country is 32. Rwanda 5 million, in a country of 20, and Lima 7 million, in a country of 30 million. Uh, I think that the relation between the main city and the country somehow reveals different contexts where the cities appeared. And uh, we, I want to look at uh, the globalization process, then analyze different types of cities and contexts, perceiving the human dynamics in those contexts, trying to see, uh, look into uh, a little bit into Morocco, and then fi uh, finally discussing some uh, common uh, thoughts that eventually are not so, so uh, right in understanding cities. So that was, uh, this is a, well, the, an introduction of a chapter, or, 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 or the introduction of a chapter of a book that I produced on emerging issues for regional development. And what I see, uh, what we see here is in fact that are forces that we don't control. Globalization, financial crisis, knowledge society, climate change, energy paradigms. There are impacts and then policy is at the bottom right there. And our reactions in policy are, as is, it was told previously, it is usually on those tools that we dream of or on those tools that we have access to. And, uh, and impacts are useless. And uh, uh, so now we dream about changing the energy paradigm, talking about climate change, knowledge society, and in fact the real process problems that are uh, at issue in our cities, this will happen anyway. The real problems are different and not, have no, not, no relation with these policies. And uh, so I think we, we should put policy at the bottom and not at the top, because in fact we, our capacity to intervene is very limited, and mainly to understand and then eventually to correct something, but uh, mainly to understand. What I've done to present in Mexico, and I think it's useful here as well, is try to see, look into country specificities. And what I've done, I've looked into the World Bank database, pick up all the relative measures that you can compare country by countries, normalize them, and then do some component, principal component analysis. And trying to find the, uh, the, what are the main, and organize these uh, uh, as if the countries were variables and not observations. So somehow we got uh, these seven components are uh, typical countries that uh, somehow explain uh, the surrounding. And interestingly, those countries are more or less organized by uh, geography. So the first component is developed countries. Unfortunately, I don't have the more developed countries because those countries don't give data to the World Bank so that, to, to, for 2010. And I wanted to have uh, a major look on Latin America. So, But then, anyway, there are these seven uh, types of countries, the welfare countries, migration countries, poor countries, countries that save a lot, China and India, countries that with rent-seeker cities, resource-rich countries and public intervention countries in the south of Africa. And each one of these countries, then I, to address this problem here, I pick up some of the variables that eventually are interesting for uh, urban issues. And, uh, for instance, welfare countries, they have a lot of uh, public health expenditure. That's why the, the British like very much to put in the uh, Olympics this uh, NH, NHS, NHS uh, process. And, and they have urban growth low, the savings per capita very low, and then urban population growth very low, natural resource rents low, and workers' remittance low. But if you move to 
uh, migration countries, we are Morocco is part of it and also part of the Caribbean uh, countries. Their workers' remittance is a, a lot in GDP. The public health, uh, normal urban growth, uh, relatively low, and then uh, the other aspects as well. Uh, poor countries, uh, workers' remittance low, so this is mainly African, uh, sub Saharan African, urban population growth very high, public health expenditure also very high. And uh, this is uh, Southeast, so Asia and uh, China and India, savings per capita very high, urban population for growth very, uh, growth very high, but the urban population relatively low to according to the population. And then uh, Latin America is, is, is uh, quite uh, strange because there is a lot of uh, urban population. They live on natural, re natural, rents, natural uh, rents from natural resources, uh, a lot of savings and urban growth also uh, very high. And workers' remittances, not the Caribbean, but the, uh, and the other part of South America, uh, very, uh, very low. And then you have Central Asia, which are mainly... Uh, countries that produce oil, and then uh, Southern Africa, which have a lot of uh, urban population and also urban growth, but also a lot of public health, uh, public uh, intervention in the system. And putting these all together, we, in fact, we notice that the, the countries that are, um, so the, these are developed and emerging, but those countries that we think that are underdeveloped, the South America, the uh, South Africa, the uh, best in the southern part of the Mediterranean and the, and, uh, and the Caribbean and the Sub-Saharan Africa, the structure, the problems that I have in related with all the issues, uh, the indicators that I have related with the urban issues are relatively different. So in terms of urban growth and urban population, all of them, uh, these two are, are equal, but uh, Morocco is quite different, so th although there is a uh, urban population is quite high, but there is some control over uh, urban growth. And, uh, and the poor countries, there is a lot of urban growth, but uh, the urban population is quite, uh, quite low. Um, now, my question on how uh, Morocco is like that, or Morocco or other countries that send a lot of, uh, uh, that somehow the, the, the slums that exist in Angola or in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or in Accra, don't exist here. And, uh, and what is different, uh, in fact, in, this is uh, uh, south of Tangier, is a basin that I stu we studied with, with Abdel Atif, and all, all of these are small villages, like this one. And there is a lot of, well, this area is not big, but anyway, there is one, uh, a density of one, uh, 100 people per square kilometer, which is relatively high for this, uh, this type of environment. But uh, my question is that although the uh, people living in slums will increase in sub-Saharan Africa and it's not expected to increase, this is a World Bank uh, thing in, uh, in the Maghreb, I wonder if that can be stabilized, if that can be like that, if there is a crisis in Europe, a financial crisis, and then the lower remittances from the people that, uh, from Moroccans that live in, in, in Europe, and then uh, these people that live here and somehow just stay there eventually. Well, I, I was explained earlier that they, have, they are commuters, that they live in the countryside and then they live in the city, but that can be sustained only if there is external money because it's not possible to have the standards of Moroccans with a, in, a, in a just... With that it goes to create multiplier effects in the center, 
and uh, the people from the, somehow the cohesion policy like to distribute these rents to the border in order to keep the, the property rights uh, in the center. And somehow our colleagues from environmental economics uh, defend that the rents of the natural resource must be owned locally in order to have a better management of those uh, environmental management of those resources. And, and what happens, in fact, since ever in Latin America is that all those rents from the natural resources goes to the center. And that's why they have bigger, there were no agglomeration, big agglomeration economies in the Maya system or in the Aztec system or in the Spanish colonial times. All the rents of the natural resource goes to the center. The same somehow happens with, uh, with, uh, uh, with Europe nowadays, with the peripheral Europe, that the rents of the location and of, of the sea and of the that uh, of the location to uh, in the Mediterranean somehow is collapsed, is, is, is concentrated a little bit in the center. So that barrier created after the crusades in the Mediterranean between the north and the south, that somehow created, so so they became a, a border and not, a, and not the center. And, and, and so this is one, one, one crucial issue. We cannot look at the regional development and urban issues without looking at the rents of the natural resources and the rent, and natural resources, not only the resources, but also the location, possibly the culture, and so on. The second point is that, in fact, our, uh, the cities that collapse are cities that grow based on infrastructure. Because we assume that somehow in the border there is a conflict between uh, agriculture use and, and urban use, but in fact there is no, uh, because the city is made by the, the state. And so you need public goods, and you need infrastructures, and the, and the state has a lot of power also to buy, uh, the, to build these infrastructures. So the city, in fact, grows not according to the where the marginal benefits are equal to the marginal costs, but the city grows when the, in a tragedy of the commons phenomenon when the average benefits are equal to the average costs. That's why the cities can grow fast. Of course, there are uh, positive externalities that somehow it's not, if, if it is just marginal cost equity or marginal benefits, we are not having all the public effect. But we don't know where it is. We don't know, because in fact we can grow the city, and that somehow is, uh, can be what happened in uh, Chinchen Itze, in Aztec Mayas, in, in Rome, where you somehow you grow, you grow based on the rents of the natural resources, and then you lose control of the border, and then Rome collapses. And, and, and we must, uh, as cities grow, we must somehow look into this. Uh, we feel, uh, a, a way to look at, into this is somehow, this is American uh, metropolitan areas, and I, I relate the number of counties per metropolitan area with the population density, and there is some line that somehow shows that if uh, a metropolitan area is uh, divided into many, which is... Uh, then, then each, each quarter must pay his own infrastructure. So the city grows where the marginal cost is equal to the benefits, which is somehow a little bit different from the integrated planning of our, uh, that somehow we defend. That, that does not mean that we don't need an integrated perspective, but eventually the growth of the city could be more controlled if each quarter pays his own. And finally, that's the problem of of infrastructures. Uh, yeah, if we have migrants, this is Wambu uh, in, uh, in Angola. This is only 10% is a formal city. And that city could, could be formal during the colonial times because there was this indigenous control. So uh, people from, from, the, from the village could not come to the city. But after the independence, hopefully all the people came to the came surrounding the city, but at the rhythm that was impossible to create infrastructures. But, uh, and, now, uh, and now the city has a low density, and because there is this relation between the cost of infrastructures and the uh, density of the population, now it's very expensive to, to build infrastructures. So one solution here in, to build new cities, to build new, new quarters. Another solution made by somehow the Chinese is to control the urbanization. So you have two passports, so you somehow you control the movement into the city. But eventually you build the, these uh, infrastructures along with, uh, with, uh, with the city growth. I think eventually we must discover what is the crucial point. And uh, for instance, in Angola, I think the crucial point is to have 
engineers and architects that are able to build three-store buildings because these people can only build two one-store building. So if you have people that are able to build three-store buildings, eventually the density will be different. Sometimes I, I think we should discover these low-scale uh, tools that, in fact, can influence the, the structure of the, uh, or, or the growth of the slums and the control of the slums. Thank you very much.